All right. That's my job. My main job is to get Steve to remember to record. I'm pretty much done now. I'll yeah. Leave. So hey. uh, my name is Steve Lambert, and I'm Steve Duncan, and yeah. uh, collectively we're the Steves. Um, we run something called the Center for Artistic Activism, which is a research and training institute. Um, and we've worked around the globe with uh, around, what is it, 1,000 artists and activists from okay. what, 11, 12 countries, um, about four continents. And what we try to do is work with activists to help them create more like artists and work with artists to get them to strategize more like activists. Um, because we think that there's a really powerful combination of arts and activism, of um, affect and effect. Um, and I think I just think so. We've seen it work many times. Yeah, we've, we've totally seen it work. Um, and unfortunately, we've seen it work um, for the other side as well. Um, I mean, I think a lot of ways the Trump victory was a victory of style, a victory of aesthetics, a victory of feelings um, over rationality and reason and facts and truth. Um, we believe you can actually combine the two, that you can combine aesthetics and truth um, feeling and effectiveness, um, and so that's what we've been trying to do for the past almost decade now. Yeah. So we're doing these webinars, as you probably know, uh, because we've done this work, but the funding that uh, allows us to do it has taken us mostly out of the country for the last three years, and we have not been able to do many programs in the U.S., and uh, after the election we felt like we needed to make this information available as best we could. Normally we do a five-day in-person workshop. Um, it's nice to be able to have that kind of experience with people in a room together, but we need to reach a whole lot more people with this, so this is, this is what we're doing. Um, so today we're going to talk about how the pieces fit together in a campaign, right? So how, because what we want essentially is for your actions as you move forward to have a bigger effect than just a one-off action. As questions come up for you, there is a little panel on the probably on the right side of your screen where you can ask questions. Um, we have our helpful uh, person, Joe Hill. Joe Hill is uh, going to be helping to comb through those questions today and then um, moderating a bit. So if at any point you have questions, feel free to ask questions. Uh, you want to bring Joe up for a second? Um, sure. Joe, do you want to say hello? Let me uh, get this here. You can see Joe. Joe needs to um, remain anonymous. Joe, there you are now. We can hear you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, Joe. Hey. Thank you for joining us. And if you can turn on your camera, people can see you. There we go. Okay. Um, as we said, Joe has to uh, remain anonymous. We're actually quite serious about this. Um, <laughs> For, for very uh, complicated reasons. But Joe will be revealing herself um, in future months. In our next webinar, you'll find out Joe's true identity. Right. Uh, but Joe will be handling the questions for us. And uh, so, Joe, thank you. We'll see you again in a bit. OK, no problem. Oh, I want to mention one thing. Yes. We, we made a survey. So we really want to find out more about you, um, the participants, and your answers are going to really help us be more specific in future webinars and give you more of what you need. So it's just seven questions, and thank you in advance. We'll send that out afterwards in an email. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and as we mentioned before, um, we are recording this. And the recording, if you're registered, will be made available to you. You'll get a link and download it. We'll also be putting it on our site. So if you want to share it with other people, you can. Did you um, what, yeah. what we're doing you is, record? what's that? Did you hit record? I did hit record. Okay. Um, all the work that Steve and I do is released with a Creative Commons license um, so that you can share this all we ask for is that you credit us and that you don't, uh, if you're going to make, try to use it somehow, I don't know how, to make money, that you just ask us beforehand. But otherwise, you're free to share it with people. Um, uh, and we ask if you use it in something else and change it to let us know what those changes are so that we can improve. So you're free to share all this stuff. Yeah, and we can um, learn from you. And so we're a really small and scrappy organization, and we did not budget for a webinar series. We do not budget for a Trump uh, election. 
And we're running this out of our own pocket at the point, at this point. And so we like to say, you know, if you want to support us, like if you were to take us out for coffee, right, you'd probably pick up our bill for coffee. And so, you know, we'll give you a link at the end if you want to contribute what a coffee would cost, wherever you are. Um, that would be great. If you want to take us out to lunch, that would be awesome. If you want to take us out to dinner with a couple of desserts, maybe some after-dinner drinks, uh, you know, you can, you can contribute that much as well. So you can you. donate at all these levels. Yes, exactly. So, Steve, are we, are we ready? We are. So, um, so following up on last week, uh, we just wanted to say a couple things. One is that Steve and I uh, might, we, we seem uh, like we're in good spirits. It is a performance. Yeah, it is a performance. Just as angry and sad as you, I have, um, I, I'm proud of the fact that I've gone a couple days without crying. Um, thinking of the different people that we've worked with over the years and how this presidency is going to affect them is deeply troubling. So we just wanted to let you know that, you know, we're experiencing that too. Yeah, and while we joke around a lot, it's a lot of it is gallows humor. It's about understanding that we're in this for the long haul and we've got to be able to laugh as well as we cry. And in all cases, we've got to figure out how to work as effectively as we can. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I was going to say is, uh, as we do these webinars, like so, we're going to do like a series of them. We're planning on about ten or twelve. Each of them is going to build on each other. So we hope you'll come along with us because they'll they'll kind of start to connect and deepen as we go. Um, we also want to try to make it as accessible as possible. If you're coming to this one and you didn't see the last one, you'll be okay. But um, the combination hopefully will will work better. Yeah, and so should we get into the creative campaign stuff? Yeah, just, just before we do, um, when we send out uh, a message to you afterwards, it will have um, where you can access the ones that have been taped before. So you can always move backwards. It's sort of like Netflix in that way. Um, yeah. Backwards and forwards. You can binge watch our webinars. If you wanted to. Um, but in any case, yeah, let's move forward. And what we're going to be talking about today <clears throat> is creative campaigns. And the first question is, well, what do we actually mean by a creative campaign? And the, the reason we're doing this is because there, a lot of us have found some kind of new motivation, right? Some of you have been, have been doing this kind of work before, but there's a renewed sort of urgency, right? Some of, them are, some of you might be coming to it for the first time. Um, but we want that motivation to lead that, to actions that are effective, right? Um, we don't want to have people decide they want to organize, get together, have a big meeting, and then have that meeting be like 40 minutes of everyone introducing themselves and then talking about how terrible everything is, and then we're out of time and everyone goes home, right? Or even if that meeting is generates an action is to think about we're going to do one action and we're going to put all this effort into one action and then be depressed, surprised, or delusional in thinking that that action has actually changed anything. We like to say what we're really interested in is moving beyond the gesture. Um, we're, a lot of us are angry, we're all upset, we want to do something, but what we want to do is more than just a gesture that makes us feel good or that releases some of this energy and grief, but actually doing something that has real impact in the social world. And in order to do that, we have to think beyond just the gesture and start thinking about how do all the pieces fit together in a creative campaign. Yeah. So not just doing these one-off actions, but figuring out way, what the bigger purpose is, what the bigger goal is, makes them um, more effective. So I'm going to pull up. We, we, uh, this is something that we talk about in the workshops, and I'm going to pull up our, our screen here. Um, so basically what we're going to do in the next few minutes is give you a real crash course in organizing. Some of you might be organizers. Some of this may be familiar. Um, but the, the difference is we're going to talk about how this fits in when you're, when you're uh, working on a creative campaign. Right? So, uh, so show some pictures, Steve. Yeah, let's show some pictures. Okay. So all these pictures we're going to show, these images we're going to show, should be familiar. This is the sit-ins in, um, this was in Charlotte. North Carolina, and um, 
1963. This is, of course, Rosa Parks refusing to give up her bus seat to a white man and thereby triggering the Montgomery bus boycott and kind of reigniting a civil rights movement. This is second wave feminists um, throwing away outside a quite apropos a Miss Universe contest um, in Atlantic City and throwing girdles and bras and so on and so forth into a freedom trash can. And this is uh, evidence of a boycott, right, by the United Farm Workers. Um, and so we actually, these are probably familiar to most of you, and it's often how we're taught about social movements. Um, we're taught about Rosa Parks sitting down um, and refusing to give up her seat. We're talked about those students in North Carolina who actually went into Woolworths and took over lunch counters and demanded to be served. We're, talk, we're, we're taught about second wave feminists and the sort of refusal to go along with what a woman was supposed to be like and United Farm Workers and the boycotts of lettuce and the organizing they did in the fields of California and Arizona and Nevada. But those images we have are just the tip of the iceberg. They're just the tactics that they used. When Rosa Parks sat down on that bus and refused to give up her seat, she wasn't just some tired seamstress who had had enough and said, I'm not going to take it anymore. She was the secretary of the local NAACP. She had been trained at the Highland Institute. She had come from a political family and had a political background after, or a political trajectory after this. She did what she did as part of a campaign. And why the Montgomery bus campaign was so effective and why the civil rights campaign was so effective was all those images of tactics were part and parcel of a bigger plan. And that plan is what we call as a campaign. Yeah. So artists, so these are the most visible forms that this stuff takes, right? Like when we think of activism, we think of that this output. And artists are also familiar with this, right? Those of you that are artists is like what people see in the end is the product of the process, right? Tactics are the product of the process. It's the finished, in a way, the finished work. But it's not the only thing that goes into the process. The process is the campaign. So let's get into that. Um, so all, ta all processes have sort of four components, I mean, I'm sorry, all campaigns have four components. Um, the goals, the strategies, their objectives, and their tactics. And so we want to kind of pull these back um, and go through them one step at a time. So let's start with goals, okay? Yeah. Goals are the grandiose ideas. The utopian dreams that we were talking about last week that guide us to where we want to go, okay? There, when the civil rights movement would sing the old civil rights hymn, uh, keep your eyes on the prize, this is what they were talking about. The absolute prize, which was going to be racial equality in the United States. They knew that they would probably never get there. They knew that even if they were to get close to it, it was going to be a long slog, but they had this idea and ideal which was what they were heading for. And as we talked about last week, it's really important to have this point out on the horizon, even if we don't reach it, because it allows us to orient ourselves. It gives us direction, and it allows us to think about, are we getting closer, or are we not getting closer? Do you have anything more to add to that, Steve? Yeah, I mean, going back to what we talked about last week, about how important it is to have this in your mind of like what you're really working towards especially when there's so many distracting sort of real life, you know, uh, obstacles in the way to know what the bigger goal is, is what orients us, right? So we're going to get into that more. The next thing is the strategy. And I, I like to think about each of these in, in the metaphor of a landscape, right? We talked about this horizon thing, right? So the goals at the horizon. The strategy is how you navigate the landscape. So how you move around the obstacles, what is the quickest path, and the way that you're going to do it. Um, 
Should I go to objectives? Are you good? Well, one more thing. And, and there's many different strategies. And actually, a campaign itself might incorporate yeah. different strategies. For example, you take the civil rights movement. They had an electoral strategy. They had a legal strategy. They had a protest strategy. Um, they also had a cultural strategy. Um, because we're speaking to what we, you know, what we think are people who are interested in arts and activism, we're probably going to be thinking about this in terms of a creative strategy. That is, how do we mobilize the skills and the talents that we have as creators and actually use those in order to move through this field and get towards our goal? Yeah, those are the, the, that's the, the way that we know best, probably. Um, okay, so landscape again, right? Goals of the horizon, strategy is how you move through it. The objectives are the milestones along the path so that you know that you've made progress, right? They're, they're the landmarks. We've passed this. We've done this. And these are super important because while it's important to have these far out goals, utopian goals, you also want to be able to know, one, am I actually moving towards it? And two, am I actually getting done anything done in the real world? Um, and so objectives are these very concrete goals, sort of mini goals, if you will, that you can step back from and say, yes, we met that objective, or no, we didn't meet that objective. So for example, in the civil rights movement, registering 50% of African Americans in a certain county in Alabama by election time would have been objective towards a much larger goal of racial equality in the United States. But those organizers needed to have something specific which they could actually apply all of their efforts, and as we'll talk about later, tactics, in order to actually bring about social change and bring it about in such a way as they were confident that, yes, we are moving forward. Every campaign has multiple objectives towards that goal. Um, and those objectives you want to think about is what needs to happen first in order for the second one to happen, in order for the third one to happen. For example, to get black political power in the South, our goal can be we want black political power in the South, but that ain't going to happen unless one of your previous objectives is to register voters and to have black politicians run for office, both of which objectives which need to happen before this greater objective. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, yeah. So the last one is tactics, and this is, these are, in our landscape metaphor, the individual steps. The steps that move us towards those objectives, the, the sort of milestones, the markers along the way, and the steps that move us towards that horizon, the goal, the, where we want to be. The tactics take the form of the things that people see, the expression of the idea. The, those uh, examples, for, historical examples we've shown you, or, you know, it could even be a meeting. It could be a phone call. It's like all the individual steps that help you achieve that objective. It can be artworks. It can be, um, it can be spending time in the studio. It can be one of the tactics that you, you've got to do. You've got to work on it every day in order to make the thing that's going to do this and this and this, right? Before we move on too far, Steve, do you want to go back to objectives and talk about smart objectives? I, well, we have that in the slides. The other thing I was thinking about is that studio metaphor. Let, yeah. let me run through the studio metaphor with the goals here. Okay. So, so th this stuff is kind of a, a little abstract, and we're talking about mostly in terms of organizing and politics. But this is not, uh, this sh should not be a foreign concept to you. It's something that we do kind of intuitively all the time. And the example I like to use is like if I was uh, looking for a new studio. I'm in my studio right now. It's full of crate. That's the capitalism sign back there, and it's taking a lot of space. So say I needed a new studio, right? So I would have a goal in mind, which is like I want this like big, uh, I don't know, five thousand square foot warehouse space that has amazingly fast internet and big uh, windows with light coming in, and I want a loading dock, right? Like all this stuff that I actually cannot afford, <laughs> but I want it, right? And that's ideally what I want. But I will settle for some things in between. But I know that's, that's kind of what I'm looking for, right? So that's my big goal. And then I have objectives. In order to get the studio that I, that I want or get close to it, um, there's some things I need to do. 
One is like figure out how much I can spend um, and like create a budget for myself. That is a thing that I know when I do that, I've made a step towards it, right? Another thing would be um, I want to visit at least five different rental spaces where I can check out studios. I need to do that in the next week um, in order to make progress on this. Um, I need to, what would be another objective for getting a studio? Um, I think, well, you would, I mean, you would really just have to, for example, look on the internet. You'd have to look on, look in newspapers in order to actually find out what's possible out there. Another objective you might have is that you know you're not going to be able to afford this yourself, and so you're going to put out a call and try to get some of your friends to pool the resources in order to get a big studio. So all these are objectives for my for my for me getting a new studio. Then uh, oh, and the objectives have to be. Uh, we're going to talk about specific objectives, but let me go back. Um, let me go back to this list. Um, Tactics would be getting out and looking at these spaces, right? It would be making phone calls to people, re rental spaces to, uh, to make appointments, all the different steps I would have to do to get the studio. The one thing I, uh, I skipped in there is strategy. My strategy would be like how I'm going to get this done. And that could be like simply, all right, every day uh, at 5 o'clock, right before I eat dinner, I'm going to go on Craigslist and I'm going to search for studios. I'm going to look through. I'm going to make at least, uh, I'm going to, you know, make these phone calls, right? So that's how I'm going to get it done. Then on Saturdays, I'm going to go out and visit, visit these studios. That's my strategy, right? So that's an example. You can, you can apply it to all kinds of things. Yeah, I was going to say is that it, as you make dinner tonight, or for those of you people on the other side of the world, uh, make breakfast, you'll realize that you set out a goal, and there's obje which is I want to feed myself. You're going to have objectives. Which I want to feed myself an amazing, wonderful meal. Right. I'm going to make a Pop-Tart. You're going to have tactics, which is I'm going to stick a, use a toaster and stick a, a, the, the Pop-Tart in the toaster. Um, and the overall strategy is I'm going to be using the materials I have in my refrigerator at this moment and my skills or lack thereof as a cook. Um, we do this all the time. Life would be impossible without these sort of mini campaigns. And what we're doing here is not showing you something new, but actually sort of analyzing what we do already, pull it apart a little bit, so you can get a handle on it and then approach it more intelligently and more efficiently. Yeah. So Steve and I are all about these like rules of thumb that can save you a bunch of time. Um, this is one that we, and we also are about uh, stealing uh, techniques and ideas from as many different uh, sources as we possibly can in order to, to be effective. So one of the ones, what's that? I think it is one we stole from business. Yeah. And you, th those of you that have worked in offices might know this. So what makes a good objective, and they, they, they call them smart objectives, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, so how do we make a good objective? This is a good rule of thumb to make sure that you're making a good objective. One is it has to be specific, right? So if I'm trying to get a studio, one of my objectives uh, can't be like, well, I want to check out some places. That is not specific, right? A specific objective would be, I'm going to look at five different places that are within a mile radius of my house. Right? Or, or if we think in terms of activism, a specific objective would be something like, I am going to register African American voters in this area. Yeah. Now, measurable. Um, I'm going to look at five different places. Right? That's something I can measure. If I do four, I know I've come in under what I hoped for and I need to work harder. If I do more, then I know I'm over my thing, but I can measure how well I've, I'm meeting that objective. And again, using the example of the Civil Rights Movement in the South, 45% of African Americans of voting age, I want to get registered. If I get 35, I know I need to work harder. If I get 60, man, this is great. I've succeeded beyond my expectations. The next one is that your objective needs to be achievable. It has to be something that you can actually do, right? So if I knew that my next week in the United States is Thanksgiving, it's a holiday, most people aren't around, it's kind of starting on Wednesday. Um, so if I set my objective for next week, I would need to adjust it in order to make sure that it was achievable within that week. Right. And if I have only six organizers working with me, I'm probably not going to be able 
to register every single eligible African American voter in all the state of Alabama. It's just not going to happen. And so when we set unachievable objectives for us, it actually leads us into the sense of futility. So it's very important to think about, can I actually get this done? We can stretch it a little bit, but still, can I actually get this done? Okay. The next one is relevant, meaning that the objective needs to be relevant to our bigger goal, right? So if I found a space, or if I started looking at um, all kinds of vacant restaurant spaces, that's not, you know, because they're around and they're available on Main Street in my town. That's getting me off track, right? So I need to make sure that the objective that I set out is on the path towards the bigger goal. And again, relevancy going back to the voting, is that actually getting people to vote is a step on black political power in the South, which is a step towards equality. There's all sorts of great things one could do, what you can imagine, you know, you, um, that may not be directly relevant. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this idea of relevancy when using arts in a second, because there's a little slippage there sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th th this also keeps you from being sort of distracted by every opportunity, right? Yes. Uh, because you'll be presented with all kinds of things that we can do. But if we're going to achieve the goal, we need to sort of stay focused. All right. And then the last one is time-based. So if I say, yeah, I want to get a studio you know, sometime, or I'm going to look at some studios eventually or in the near future, it just makes it too vague, right? If I say I'm going to look at five that are within a mile radius of my house that are within this amount of money, and I'm going to do it within this week, that's that's uh, kind of gives me... <laughs> Without the time thing, I can be like, well, I looked at five, but it took me five months, right? It just, it's another way that you get off track. Yeah. And again, going back to the activist example, we know there's an election coming up in three months. We know that it takes X amount of time to have registrations filed. And so we know that we have to register these 45 people in two weeks. And that gives us a time frame to work with it. But so Steve, can I ask you something? So. I come from an activist background and a social science background, so I am totally okay with this. Like, I actually like numbers and things yeah. like. But doesn't this kind of freak you out as like an artist? Aren't you supposed to be like all like, "Hey, man, it's just all about like how people feel," and I just put my work out there, and I don't know. I just want to like I don't know raise awareness and start discussions. I mean, isn't that what you think all the time? <laughs> I well no, um, but I have felt resistance to this, and it does come up, right? Um, because when I was, I, I've, the the most recent experience was when I was in South Africa working on the AIDS conference, and I found myself working in an office, and we were working towards specific objectives on the AIDS conference, and I had this discomfort where I was like. Wait, wait, I'm an artist, you know, like I'm, I'm, I want to do whatever I want, like, you know, and like, I, but I knew I had chosen to do this, but it, it comes up. So the thing that I would say, two things, one is we use this all the time. We just don't articulate it. And the less we articulate it, the worse, it, it just makes for uh, problems, right? It, like it keeps you from, from being more productive and, and we need, you know, I don't think I need to make the case that we need to get as much done as we possibly can as soon as we can. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the the other thing is that these constraints are freeing. Um, I'll tell a quick story. I got offered um, a residency at Spaces, which is an amazing artist-run space in Cleveland. And they called me and they said, you know, we, we love what you do. We'd love for you to come here and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and I was like, okay. No. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's very nice of you. Um, why did you why did you call? Like, why did you decide to call me? Yeah. And um they're like, oh we, yeah, we just think what I'm like, is there anything specific? You know, like did you like this project? You'd like me to do something similar in Cleveland? I'm like, no, 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 we just yeah, you know, we want you to come here, you can do whatever you want. And it was like so frustrating. I had no idea where to even begin. And uh, and so I 
I remember telling them, like, just throwing out the most ludicrous thing I could think of, which was um, Dennis Kucinich is from Cleveland. And I was like, I want to collaborate with Dennis Kucinich. So call him, tell him I want to meet with him, and then I'll come out there and that's what we'll do. And I expected them to say, no, 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 we, we didn't mean that. We meant, and then to finally give me some boundaries to work within so that I could start to come up with ideas. But instead they said, because they're awesome, they're like, okay, we'll call them, we'll get back to you. And that didn't pan out, and that turned into the capitalism sign, but that's another story. But anyway, the, the having no constraints, having, being able, it's like, if you could make an artwork and you had infinite amounts of time and money and, and you know, it's like, it's, it's actually crippling. Yeah. But having these constraints help. And I think we all have been at that meeting, that ill-defined meeting, in which nobody is called an end time, and no one is called uh, for what we actually want to get out of the meeting, and it mm -hmm. just ends up extending forever. You feel guilty as you walk out the door. You feel like two hours of your life has been taken out of, and sort of just wasted because there wasn't a clear idea of like, why are we in the room? What do we want to do? And when are we going to leave the room? Now, those constraints can be actually pretty wide. That is, the objective might just be getting people in a room so they can grieve. And we will be here as long as it's possible. But it's, as Steve said, it's articulating the specificity, articulating the time, so we know why we're doing what we're doing. Because in the end, with more clarity and purpose, we actually end up having much more effective actions. We get more bang for our buck. When we create tactics that are actually moving towards objectives which we understand what they're supposed to do. Now, it doesn't always work that way, right? And that that's doubly so when we're working with medium like arts and creativity, is it's always full of unintended consequences. And that's actually what the magic of art is, is we like to say there's always a surplus of meaning that comes with art, uh, a surplus of affect and effect, right? We can't quantify it, but we need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Another metaphor I'll use is like jazz. Right, so we think of a jazz solo as, oh, just, you know, guys just playing whatever he wants. But actually, they're playing over a set of chords that are in like an A, B, B, A structure. Um, and you can stray from them, but it's always rooted against that, unless it's free jazz. That's, then my metaphor falls apart. But it's always, you know, on this layer of, of chord changes that go through a cycle of verse, chorus, whatever, right? And then on top of that, it's like you work around that. And so we can do amazing, wild things using those constraints and make this beautiful music. So Steve, how do all these things fit together? Yeah, Just so we slide. said, do this. yeah, yeah. Uh, they're called smart objectives. You probably figured out why. Um, so uh, uh, those are helpful, again, rule of thumb to make sure that you're, you have outcomes that you can work towards when you're dealing with a sort of big, idealistic, long-term, never quite achievable utopic goal. Um, so uh, those are objectives. Okay, then the strategy, again, is how you do that. And I'm just going to go through to our map here. And then tactics, the steps along the way, the actions that we're going to take, the many actions we will need to take in order to get to an objective. When you put all these together, it makes a campaign. And here's a sort of visual representation of that, right? We've got the goal way off in the distance, and our strategy is how we do this, right? But we've got objectives that are our mileposts, and then tactics in between, right? And the key is, is they all work off one another, is that you create tactics which actually want, you want to use to bring about your objective. Um, and it also often takes multiple tactics in order to bring around a singular objective. But you also want to be thinking down the line and make sure that the tactics, even at that early stage, are going to resonate and be relevant to objectives farther down the line. Um, and you want to make sure, again, that the objectives are structured in such a way as they flow into one another. And very importantly, this goes back to our discussion about utopia last week, that your goal, that a fragment of that goal, a kernel of that goal, is embedded within every single fragment and every single objective. And so that even at the smallest level, there's a little glimpse of utopia. 
Now, when you make these, it's not set in stone. The landscape changes, and your, uh, your strategy and your objectives will probably change accordingly in order for them to work. So in our minds, it might look like this, but in practice, it ends up looking like this. The goal moves, right? Um, you kind of like move all over the place. I would say we're closer to something like this right now, where we just took a huge step backwards. Um, but uh, I think Obama, even this last week, was talking about you know progress isn't always forward. We pay, we take these steps backwards, and um, in order for us to move forward again, we need to recalibrate, make new objectives, things like that. Now, as uh, I'm imagining, a lot of you are like individual people, and the idea of constructing this kind of thing is pretty daunting, right? Um, the good news is you don't have to do it alone. This is how you can fit into organizations. Organizations, if they are organized, should have goals and objectives, whether that's their literal mission statement or something, and then five-year plans or whatever. So if you wanted to work with other people or other organizations, you can say, and this is how I often do it, it's like, what are your objectives for this uh, conference? What are your objectives for the next year? And then we, as creative people, can help them uh, strengthen those objectives. Think about those objectives in more creative ways, bigger goals, but also then figure out creative tactics to meet those objectives. So it gets a lot easier, and, and it makes it easier to join a bigger movement when you can start to think in these ways. Yeah. And I think, and we kind of want to close on this, is that this idea of thinking about campaigns and plans over long stretches of time is also important for us as artistic activists. Um, there's a, a tendency, particularly at moments of crisis that we're facing right now, to want to do everything right now. And we should totally be doing as much as we possibly can in as many ways as we possibly can. But what's also really important is projecting yourself down the line for the next 100 days, the next four years, the next 44 years. And understanding that there's a sort of trajectory, not just of campaigns for one issue or another issue or headed towards a goal, but also a trajectory as an artistic activist, is that this is only going to work if we're in it for the long haul. We all know friends of ours who have gotten really, really fired up and set unreal standards, unachievable standards for them as activists. And we run into them three years later, and they quit. They've gotten burned out. They've become bitter. You know, they're probably I don't know either uh, work in a bookstore or you know work on Wall Street, one of the two, depending which path they took. Um, that's not going to help the movement. What's going to help the movement is being in it for the long haul. Steve and I both come from families, activist families, where our parents actually started out, and my dad started out working on apartheid in 1948. 1948, and he died about five years ago, still active in politics, still out there on the street. And along the way, he did things like had children. Um, he did things like went to dinner. Uh, he did things like you know bought a house. Uh, he liked to go on canoe trips. And one of the things I really learned from him is that we've got to pace ourselves over the long haul. We're also, as Steve likes to say, we're all going to die. Yeah. Do something with that, Steve, not just let that hang. <laughs> no, it's like we're all working with a limited amount of time and energy, right? And so I feel like we have a duty to think about how we use that time and energy in order to be the most effective. And, and we're working with other people, too, that also have limited amounts of time and energy. Partly because they're going to die, partly because maybe they have other jobs and they have a family and there's only so much time you can put into this. So the energy that you put into it does need to be sort of organized and focused. And if we don't do that, I mean, at how many meetings, I know I walk into them on a regular basis where there is no objective. It's just like we have a topic and we're talking about how bad it is or, or you know, the, the an artist, uh, if, I guess I can say this as one, and also critics are worse, 
But like, just it really enjoy teasing out how many pro how complicated this problem is, right? Like, I cannot stand that word problematic. But anyway, um, you know, so it's like you go into these meetings and it's like, oh, wow, it is so much more problematic than you realize. Oh, it's very problematic. There's this and this and all these problems are connected. It's like, okay, great, great. What are we going to do? What, what, let's set an objective, you know, and, and it, it's a little uncomfortable to bring this into a meeting, but everyone will thank you because you will get more done, right? That, that conversation has a focal point and a direction. And once you have that direction, it makes brainstorming about tactics so much easier. Because you can actually, all tactics can be great. But not all tactics are actually applicable towards a particular objective and have a kernel of the ultimate goal within them. And so again, it goes back to what Steve was saying about creating within these constraints allows you actually this burst of freedom and also the ability for other people to join the discussion. Because if everybody's just going off brainstorming their own tactics without any criteria for what they're supposed to get done, it's like apples and oranges and pears and bananas and so on and so forth. And we should really be, and I know this metaphor is not going to work, but like all working on the banana. <laughs> okay, that didn't work. But you know what I mean. One of our objectives is going to be work on that. Yeah, exactly. So um, we're now at the end of our our uh, our conversation. Um, but if anybody has any questions, Joe. Uh, uh, Joe, we can now hear you. And I'm gonna uh, have you turn on your camera. Get your mask back in place because Joe needs right. to remain. Oh no, that's that's my face. I don't know what you're talking about. Hi, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> so you've been looking at the questions. Um, and what what questions do you have? Yes, I need to ask you about that. Maybe there's a technical difficulty because I don't. I, I think we didn't activate people's question box. No, it's there. I can. I see them. You do? Oh. I don't see them. Okay. Um, you're gonna try. <laughs> Joe, stay with us, but I, I don't see them either. So. All right. Well, here we go. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you're like this one. Some of the words you're using, duty, objective, strategy, tactics, these words feel very American, uh, very conqueror-like. Conqueror How has your work in non-capitalist, non-imperialist nations changed the way you think about tackling projects and meeting goals? Um, I actually, I, I think that they're American because we're used to associating them with things like business and with military objectives. But we work, uh, we've worked in Nairobi, we've worked in South Africa, we've worked in Russia, we've worked in the Balkans, and everybody has a version of this. Um, and all effective organizers have some version of these. They may not use those direct terms, and if we would suggest if those direct terms make you uncomfortable, you should reject them and make up your own terms. I think that would be awesome, right? But still the idea that one needs a focus is actually, in our experience, something that people we work with around the world have a much better grapple, a much better handle on than folks we sometimes work with in more privileged situations. Because when we're talking about maternal health care and people dying, you really have to have an idea of what the objective is, which is we need to get this medicine to these people by this time or we're going to die. It's when we have a bunch of artists in a room that are trying to think about raising awareness about X that you have the luxury to throw all this out and just kind of drift. So I encourage you to make up your own words, but don't throw out the ideas of focus, the ideas of understanding how tactics apply to that focus, and how all these things can work together in the overall movement. Um, I have a, a quick thing that I've, I've came up with a long time ago. Um, if you are resistant to the ideas, um, I get that. You know, like a lot of this stuff is used to do awful things, um, but there's this tendency to like throw it all away and try to come up with uh, or discover, rediscover entirely new ways. Um, which is a whole other project, and if that's a project you choose to take on, by all means, let us know uh, when when you when you've got another way. Um, but my 
my attitude is like rather than reinvent the wheel, I I like to just find a gear to make the whole thing go backwards, and insert that gear, right? And I, Steve and I appropriate a lot of things that uh, make <laughs> like tools that that we do not like how they're used elsewhere, but the concept in them is still very strong and can be used in these ways. So, so uh, one more just to add to that, I once um, was talking to someone who said had a very similar sort of discomfort with this idea. It said, well, I want my art to do nothing at all, right? And I thought about that for a second. My first reaction was, a, was reactive. It was like, what do you mean, right? All art does something. And then I was like, okay, what would it mean to think about how best to make your art do nothing at all? So if you want a completely instrumental, non-instrumental relationship with your community organization, with the people you work with, with the world that you want to create, then ask the question, how best to do that? Um, and what you'll find, strip away all of the words and so on and so forth, things will be like, well, how do I do it? What are my goals? How will I know if I'm moving forward? Um, yeah. Oh, okay, so our next question Jake asks, is art always a campaign? And I would answer no, it rarely is. It probably almost never is. A lot, a lot of what art is is individual tactics that aren't even organized towards much of an objective. Um, the, it's often just you know, a, a personal exploration or maybe there's some sort of thesis behind it, uh, an, an overarching idea. But art often does not fit into campaigns and is not thought of that way, and, and, uh, except, and this isn't always true, there have always been artists that have thought about how their work fits within a larger movement. Some and some have done it more intentionally. Some have done it more accidentally. But um, uh, the the idea that art is done by individual artists alone, and then uh, and and is not instrumentalized, and then brought to people just to sort of be looked at and considered. Uh, that idea and that conception of art serves very powerful people who like to use art as decoration and to build institutions rather than to um, use them to like create new institutions. And it's that idea keeps having to be reinforced and pushed all the time through through those institutions, right? That this is this is not meant to be used politically. It, art is a separate thing, and. Art can be used in a lot of different ways. Joe, you've done work actually, which is you know has a real purpose to it. So you want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah. Well, I think that's true. That so much of art really isn't thought about in these terms, um, in terms of objective. And I know that one of the first things that I always do is think about audience. And it's related to what you've been talking about with objectives, but it's really thinking about what do you want to achieve in terms of what the audience is coming away from with. And um, so I always start there, which is a different perspective as well. Um, so we'll do, I think if we're going to keep this on time, we'll do one more question. And I, I found a question from Ryan that has some things that are echoed by other people like Heather um, that says, she says, uh, Ryan says, hi, about 12 of us are starting to gather and organize, and I have a question about facilitating people to reach consensus about objectives and goals. Woohoo! First of all, congratulations on getting 12 people together <laughs> to work on this. Um, uh, consensus. We're not big fans of consensus. Yeah, we find that consensus, because we worked with it a lot, often ends up privileging those who are willing to stay late um, and have a lot of time on their hands. Um, and it, it, in my, my experience, I actually start to shut down in a consensus meeting, where if I know it's a majority or a supermajority that's gonna, gonna sway us, then I feel totally okay giving a minority opinion. But if I feel like I'm going to like be outside, um, I start to shut down. So we're not a big fan of consensus. That said, it may not have to be formal consensus. That is, the best thing to do is sort of what we, you know, create a room, give yourself three hours, and then just start brainstorming objectives. And it might, consensus might happen in a very natural way. The beauty of consensus and tactics is this, and objectives. 
there's always more than one objective that's needed in a campaign, and there's always lots and lots and lots of tactics which are needed for objectives. So when we do a workshop, we're going to do one tomorrow morning. Um, in 15 minutes, we have four groups of about five people brainstorm what ends up being 45 to 50 tactics. Um, really quick, and we have this little trick that we play. We make sure that the first three of their tactics are impossible tactics, are tactics which will never work for reasons of time, money, space, laws of physics, and what have you. And you'd be surprised at how much great ideas just start flowing out when we take some of that pressure off. We don't say we have to arrive at consensus, and so but we just brainstorm, and it may happen naturally. The other thing I would say is um, there's, you can get a lot more consensus and agreement the further away you get from today. Like, so the big goal, like, it, it can be very broad and big, and you get a lot more agreement on it, the more longer-term objectives people usually agree on. Um, but you don't, you, a lot of times you don't need consensus. You can kind of have a more vague idea of where you want to move, and then people can take on different objectives, and they can have different strategies because there's really no way of accurately predicting what will work. Yeah. And so if there are people that feel strongly, let them feel strongly and go do that thing with a group of people. And other, you, know, you can kind of just politely and respectfully support each other in doing these things in different ways. Yeah. We also have this technique of using animal noises to vote on things. I don't, don't even try to explain that in here. Yeah. <laughs> it. it totally works. If people don't raise their hands but have to make animal noises instead, it works. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a later webinar. That's a whole other webinar. So speaking of other webinars, we're going to do this not next week because it is a, a sort of holiday weekend here in the United States, but we're going to do it on the second, the same time, 12 to 1. Um, we have a survey that we're going to send you out. So if you have, uh, some of you have asked questions we've not been able to answer. You can send those to us. We can either answer them offline or we can try to incorporate it into a future webinar. The next one we're, we're going to do is about what is artistic activism and what is not artistic activism, kind of to sort of clarify what we mean by this. Um, and let's see, the last thing I'll say, oh, we have a, a website you can look for inspiring tactics. It's called actopedia.org. Um, we will send you a link to it in the follow-up for this. Um, and at actopedia.org, you can look up all different kinds of actions there are thousands of them? 1,800 at this point from pretty much every country or most countries in the world spanning a range of medium and they're all user generated. So they're just, when people do stuff, they put it up there and we encourage you because one of the ways we learn and we get inspired is to see what other folks are doing around us. Um, another thing you can do is help us get the word out about these webinars so if you found that these, these to be helpful to um, pass them to other people that you think might, it might help them. We'll have archived versions of them, of course, um, and then they can register for the live ones. Um, we're gonna ask you to fill out this uh, feedback form. If you could donate, uh, we would appreciate it. It's, it's helping offset the costs of this, uh, doing this. There are some real costs for us. Um, and that's at artisticactivism.org slash donate. Again, we'll send the link. Um, and uh, anything else we want to say? Mysterious Joe? Um, Tuesday is Giving Tuesday. It's a great time to donate to any nonprofit, including this one. Yes. And you can also do matching. You can, if you work for a company, you can ask your company to put us um, and other groups on the list to do matching donations. Yes. Thank you. So and if you um, yeah, if you come back and uh, to our next one, you'll find out who Joe Hill actually is. Exactly. <laughs> um, but until then, stay active, stay creative, and we'll see you all in two weeks. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye.